Let's start with prayer. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this conversation we gather this time. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to know your will. And give us the strength to carry it out. We entrust this time to you for our mother as we say, Hail Mary. Oh, oh, praise, praise the Lord. Praise 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 Blessed are thou among women, and, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, while we're out, last week we met, we decided that we were going to talk about Slender or Don't Hold the Sabbath. This is, so there is a link in the email had this information and also the letter. I wanted something that was easily accessible. Give me a good look. Oh, is this what you have a quick from? I don't want to hear this yes. email or okay, I don't have to go back. Are you on the email list? Yeah, for your posts, but I don't want to call to them. But I don't want to set that yesterday unless that's right. I'll go back. Okay. I'll check. Okay. Okay. That's possible she got it sent out. I have the other guys. Uh, but, but yeah, so this is what we're doing. Um, there's a link there. There's other places to get it for free. I want something that's easily accessible, free. Uh, but being John Paul II, it's very dense, very long. So I didn't put it out. Uh, I think it was 60 pages worth of. I think it's four times longer than I think it's like. Go that we can. Um, but a very important topic and a very timely topic. So, this is John Paul II's letter on moral theology, which are fancy words meaning what? The morals of the time. Morals of the time meaning what? <laughs> what are morals? What's morality? Rules. Uh, rules of the time. Right and wrong, yeah. <laughs> So, so this, is, this is the study of right and wrong. So then this John Paul II's letter is addressing this for a few reasons. So he, this letter what was published in 1993, but it was started in 1987. And it was started as, as the 300th anniversary of one of the doctors of the church, <coughs> upon this Lord. He wanted, he wanted to, John Paul II wanted to, to but that's for him. Besides, wait to laugh at the Catechism's published. The Catechism was published in 1992. So he wanted the Catechism being published first as a some kind of background and, and some foundation for writing this stuff on morality. And he wrote it for a particular reason because in, in the currents of the time, unfortunately, the comeback to the service in the last couple of years, there were some ideas that were floating around that were challenging. To moral theology and challenging to go, how do what's right wrong? Uh, so there were kind of three ideas that they thought for the second of looking at, um, to, to argue against and to look at. The first was then he was wanting to argue for something called the natural law. And we'll get into this in more detail. So I just come back on the first way into the text. Have you ever heard this term before? Mm -hmm. What is natural law? <clears throat> that which is innate to the human condition. That which is innate meaning what? We should know it because of how we interact with the other humans. It's a part of us. Part of us were into our creation, yeah. It was part of our main part of our creation. And so there's certain things that are, are, are we know are good and bad simply because of the best we're man. Um, you, we, we know that based upon the way we're made, murder is wrong, theft is wrong, steal is wrong. Based upon yeah, if it's something that's really into our hearts. Even the pagans think that, right. I guess, right. it's what mm -hmm. makes it apparent to me that even dead people yes. get those things. And so it's part of the way we're created. So this is, this is what's written to us 
is part of the way we're made. But because there are certain laws that we have which only apply to Catholics, which are part of being Catholic, right? Fasting on Fridays or going to Mass certain times. It's not part of our natural law. It's not everyone says, I have to, I have to abstain on, on Fridays or I have to, you know, fast 40 days and during Lent. That's something we have to be taught and learn. You know, I pray a certain way, do certain things. But murder, theft, adultery, those are things we all know. It's part of the way we're made to be. <coughs> But the current of theology jumped on the second armor again and said, this doesn't exist. So everything is from God directly or from the church. There's nothing inherent to us human beings. What's the problem? It overlooks the, that we're actually innately divine. So it's in the direction from God, but also what it says is that whether it's right or wrong, there are no absolute truths. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's yeah. When it comes to relativism, which means it just depends upon the situation. <clears throat> it's good and bad, depends on where you're at. There's nothing objectively right or wrong, is what these people were saying. A couple of seconds are arguing against those. They're very being as human beings. There's right and wrong. It's also led to this is the second thing, his argument against. This led to a um, part of the there's a rejection of the church's right to become around. Because if certain laws are only for Catholics, is this, I mean, I want like, the priest to, to tell them that my Jewish neighbor you have to fast on Friday. Right? That, that would be silly. And so all of these moral laws simply depend on the situation or depend upon the church only. The church can't speak about it. But we see this, you find that up again today. You know, does the church already speak about this? The church should already be able to. That he rolled us. And that there's also uh, the plurality, there's, there's many different religions, different cultures, different times, different places. Well, who are you to speak to those people of their culture? That if they want to do this or that, that's their business. This is good for you, but not good for them. That's your truth, it's not my truth. So, because we live in a society that had many religions, many cultures, many customs, but so therefore, who are you to say murder is always wrong, or abortion is wrong, or contraception is always wrong, or whatever, fill the blank is always wrong? This was the challenge. The John Paul II had to address. Does the church have a right to speak upon morality? Does the church have the right to speak about objective reality, which is right and wrong, is true always? Is it good and bad always? <coughs> And connected with this as well, we wanted to show that faith and morals are united. <clears throat> faith <laughs> is what we believe. <clears throat> morals are how we act. And so what we believe should should these two things should are not separate apart from each other. And if we believe there's only one true faith, only one true God, only one being, we ought to act a certain way. We ought to do certain things, we ought to live a certain way. Not just because I'm Catholic and Christian, just because I'm A, B, or C, because it's part of what these people human being. What this means then is there are things that are right and wrong at all times, all places, all situations. It means that the church has the right to say certain things are always ever wrong no matter what, period, end of story. There's no situation, this is okay. <laughs> it's never okay to murder, it's never okay to steal, it's never okay to lie. You can't say, well, it's okay to lie in this case. 
to pay the grit order in this case. One of the big uh, again, cultural things going on was people would say, well, as long as you do it out of love, you do whatever you want. And, and so if you really love your girlfriend, mm -hmm. you know, that you're gonna let's sleep together, that's fine, don't love each other. If you're really married to your spouse and you're fighting and hate each other, you lose decide to break up to get to marry somebody else, that's fine. This is being taught, not simply in the culture, this is being taught by certain Catholic theologians and Catholic universities. Don Paul II wrote this to answer this, but rest to say, no, this is the end. This is that. It's response. And finally, we wanted to talk about them as conscience, the role of conscience. What is conscience? This stuff tugging at your mind. <laughs> it says what? Tell me what you're doing. Do this or don't do yeah. this. This is don't do this. It gives you a feeling. Do you always have to follow your conscience? No. Yeah, deciding what's right and wrong. No. You need to have a well formed conscience, and then yes, you must have it. You must follow it. You should. You don't have to. You don't have to in the sense of a mechanic, but one must in the sense of moral. But you have to share your conscience as well for them. And that, that is a very key distinction. Mm -hmm. Because people would argue, they'll say, look, I follow my conscience. My conscience says this is wrong. But your conscience doesn't know sometimes. sometimes because, you yourself. because my conscience has to be built upon a higher ground. My conscience is meant to reflect the nature of God himself. My conscience is meant to be a way I can united to my creator, my Lord, and my redeemer. And therefore, the only true morality is going to be Christ himself. Christ is, the, is because he's God, Christ is the one who shows us right and wrong. So this is, this is the purpose of this letter, called encyclical. This, John Paul II is writing this to address these questions, to address this confusion, to address this difficulty. Where people would be telling would say, well, well, as long as your conscience says it's okay for you to live life, then you can just do that. As long as you're out of love, do whatever you want to do. As long as you're, well, the situation is okay. What it meant was that there's no sin right or wrong. And again, we see this come back again. Yeah. Where, where, where people are trying to reject this teaching, which is from the beginning. Um, and people are now saying, well, you know, that was John Paul II. We're smarter, we're no better now. It's like they were saying in the 70s and 80s. Well, that was the glory, that was Aquinas. We know better now, we're smarter now. So, question? Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to say, conscience, isn't that the knowledge of right and wrong? Okay. Yes and no. Um, so a simple, we'll look at more deeply, we'll get into the letter, but, but, but yes. Um, it, it is a judgment about right and wrong, helping us to think about the rule. It's a tool in our, in, our, in, our, in our mind, helping us to measure my own action according to God's law. So it, it's, it's, it's going to help me to compare what I'm about to do or have done to him and to what he says. One more note um, before we get to the Paul's in letter. And that is the nature of the law. What is law? If we feel like a time and place, we don't like law. We don't like rules. So, what is this law? What are we these laws about? Means of making sure that the their team, how people treat each other, as far as how. So it's, it's this rule, this guide for people living together and treating each other so much, uh, given by some of But I um, shouldn't it be like to direct us toward a good? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, which sometimes now they do the caves with like the government log. Correct. And, and so some of the, see, even Cicero, who was a lawyer in the, in the a pagan lawyer uh, in the first century before Christ, said that if a law is against the good, good and truth, against right and wrong, that's not a good law. Uh, and so therefore, we must obey. So there, there is a pagan recognizing this. So. But so law ultimate, so the, the first of all laws was called the eternal. And this is God's direction guidance of the universe. Now, when God creates, what does he pattern the world of? When, when God creates, so if you and I were to make something, we're going to make a table or a chair, we need a pattern. We need something to, to give us to be able to make that. Right. So we'll find something. We'll find a book, we'll find another chair we like, we'll find something when they go. When God makes, when God creates, what's his pattern? Yes, so. Himself. Yeah. Himself. So first of all, God's pattern is himself. Secondly, God is purely simple. And simple not in the, in the modern sense of being stupid, but simple in the sense that he has no parts. He's not made up of different things. We're made up of bones and, and souls and blood and guts and all that stuff. God has no parts. God just is. And what this means when we talk about God, even though we discuss God, we'll discuss God's will, and God's love, and God's truth, but, but the reality is always one thing, the same thing. God is just God. God's love is his wisdom, is his knowledge, is his heart, is his, he just, he just is. And so God's law is not separate from himself. So the eternal law really is God. Only one thing that's eternal, that's God. That does eternal. But this means that when God creates, when God makes the universe, when God dies, everything, begins to be cut off from himself. That the creation itself has God's fingerprints meant to lead everything back to himself. So when it comes to right and wrong, the purpose of the moral law is to make us like God. In the same way that the creation is to make us like God, the soul, the grace, the choice we make, the actions we make, we do right and wrong, is to make us like God. And so, if we're not becoming more like God, it's wrong. We're using the things that God makes against His will, against His truth, to harm ourselves and around us, to reject God, as our wrong things to do. But if those things are building us up, bringing us back to God, it's the right thing. And so moral law in the end is about becoming like God. This is related then to the truth. Because what we're looking at now is what is the truth about how to live? What is the truth about what's good and bad? What is the truth about how God's made us, what God said us to do, how we're going to live, what we're going to live. That is what John Paul II is talking about in addressing in this letter. Questions on this so far? Let's dive in. If you look, the I think we have here is the British spelling. You see, splendor is spelled the U with my heart. But the, a letter um, from the church, the Pope, brought an only take the first two, two or three words of God. So, very kind of splendor is taken from this first line of this blessing given by the Holy Spirit.
The splendor of truth shines forth all the works of the Creator, and especially in man created in the image by his of God. Who is the truth? Who, who, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life? I don't know. Keep that down. Truth and life man is elevated and changes truth, leading him to know and to love the Lord. Hence the psalmist prays, and the light of your face, on us, on us, O Lord. So John Paul II here is trying to say truth is like this light. And the same, the same way that the, the, the prayers of the church pray, Lord, light us with your face, let us see your light. That Christ's light is the truth, showing us how to live, how to act, how to behave, and how to have. And so we pray this, we bless us, recognize this, that makes us Christ's light, not simply point in direction, but shapes, forms, and guides, and molds us, becoming like our prayer. Introduction. Jesus Christ is the true light that lines everyone. If you notice, John Paul II just closed the service everywhere. He's always pulling from the Bible. Call of salvation through Jesus faith in Jesus Christ, the true light that lines everyone. People become like the Lord and full of life, and made holy by obedience to the truth. Disobedience is not always easy. As a result of the mysterious original sin, they did the prompting of Satan, the one who was a liar and father of lies. Man is constantly tempted to turn his gaze away from living in true God or his direct to what I was. Explaining the truth about God for a lie. Because of original sin, man's capacity to know the truth is all darkened, will submit it is all sweetened. Thus, giving himself over to relativism and skepticism was often a certain illusory you know, heart of Luther. So, John, the focus here is to get a couple of the truth. It says, first of all, everyone is called to say by God. Christ is the one. There's no other one. There's no other one. And so, he begins by looking at, um, is looking at the pluralism. You know, is that are there, we look for light you know, from other religions, other faiths, of the well, it's Christ. Christ is the answer, Christ is the light, Christ is us. And every human being is called to be happy, is called to know God, is called to know Jesus Christ. There's no other man there is per se except Jesus Christ. As he begins with that, that fact, we're all called salvation, Christ. It's not enough to say, oh, you're a good person, you're a nice person, you know, it's okay whatever you believe. Oh, we're called to know Christ. We're called to know Christ. And so we get to that fact. We're called to obey the faith of Jesus Christ. This is the first and fundamental thing to know and to live the truth, live the truth, and the right and wrong. Is to live for our Lord, walk with our Lord, fall with our Lord. However, he it says, reality is it's hard. It's tough because of the devil, it's tough because of original sin, which makes us stupid and weak. Our intellects are darkened, our wills are weak. It's hard to know the right thing, it's hard to do the right thing. My third can get very easily confused. You say, well, maybe my situation, I should still do it. Principles are always black and white. Real life can be difficult sometimes to know what those black and white principles are. People who get confused will say, well, but what about the other circumstances where it seems like if I do this, other bad things will happen? Or what about, you know, if I don't understand what the Lord's asking them to do? It's hard to know. And if we do know, then it's to our fault. I, I can very well know the Lord's asking me to pray or asking me to not do this thing or asking me to give up that thing. Because we'll say, but that's hard. I want that thing. I want to have my fourth bowl of ice cream tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, you know. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. too. No. It's all one scoop. More of a relative thing. We're discussing relativism. Well, I'll just get off the car and forget about putting it in a full house anymore. Some days. <laughs> <laughs> the will 
this week. <laughs> and there are times when I say, you know, that person in front of me, you know, they, they, they deserve a good box with another friend, like, I don't do it. <laughs> So it's easy to fall into two traps, relativism and skepticism. What is relative? My way and your way and every way and the right way. There's no right and wrong. It's based upon your person. Whatever. Yeah. So whatever is an individual allowed. You're free. You're individual. You, you're, you're, you're your own person. You, 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 the go girl. It's almost like Americanism today. Mm -hmm. Like we're teaching that to the world, kind of. Yep. Or too, with too much freedom. And what's 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 he by skepticism? Doubting. Doubting what? Anything and everything. <laughs> yeah. 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 Doubting God. Doubting right or wrong. Doubting you no. Know, what does that forget? What did the devil tell you? Did God really tell you that? Are you sure God meant that? Is there a God in the first place? Is God really, is God really mad at you if you do that? God will understand you all. God doesn't mean that. That was just, that was just old rules, like old fashioned. We're different. There's skepticism about doubts, about right and wrong, the truth, about what we know. And then we go off for illusory freedom, right? Because if I free myself from the law, from God, from having to do these things, I'm free, right? Mm -hmm. No. Not really. John Paul II was the one that made that quote about this uh, with freedom comes great responsibility for something. Oh, the Spider Man? <laughs> um, but, but, but yes, so. so this is this false freedom. People say, well, I'm going to be free to eat my, eat my bowl of ice cream as I want. What happens if I do eat four bowl of ice cream? You could be sick. You could get sick. You know, that thing. If I live in such a way where I'm lying and cheating and stealing, what happens? I have freedom. I'm miserable. The one in hell, you know, it comes out walking truth, might, walking God. So it's freedom of kind, but it's an illusion. It leads to misery, destroys me, destroys my those around me, destroys my family, destroys everyone else. So as I have the ability to go beat everybody up, the ability to go kill people, the ability to whatever, go like, this is not real freedom. Because freedom is there to make me greater, to make the world around me better, to help me do the right thing. And so because we live in a world where we're, we're, we're stupid and we're weak, it's easy to go to fall in this trap of seeking these false freedoms. Where I want to be free to do all these bad things because I don't want to have I don't, I don't want God's not what to do, whatever church I don't want to do, I don't want to. The blocks I don't want to do, the blocks I don't want to do, that I don't want to do. You know, it's that teenage new mentality of I'm an adult now, so I do whatever I want. That's it. False freedom, the illusion that tends to be true. Everywhere at three. But no darkness of error or sin can totally take away from man the light of God, the dream. It is part of the natural law, it's part of the power of dream. It's the very fact we're made by God, there's a likeness that there is part of us. Points back to God and bring it again. The depths of his heart is always remains a burning yearning for absolute truth. And the thirst to take from all the God. So we want to deepen our hearts. There is a yearning for no thought, a yearning to know God, a yearning to know anything. This is because we're made to know God and even they're made to know God, that there's a desire to know and want to know. That's why you're here. Because it'd be your heart to hear it ultimately went back to God. So that would they prove on that higher the certain God in all fields. 
is proved to be more by its first the meaning of life. Why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? And what am I meant to do? The development of science technology, despite the testimony of the human capacity of understanding and perseverance, does not for humanity an obligation to ask all religious questions. Rather, it spurs us on to face those painful and sensitive struggles, which is the heart of the moral conscience. But there are those who say well, that morality and religion was made up by people who didn't know science. And they'll say, well, yes, people may have God because they thought thunder was the God's will. You know, people may have gods, they didn't know where they came from. So, made up all of these things. But now that we know science, we know we know quantum physics, we know all the rules of nature, now that there's no need for God. Well, it's nonsense. <clears throat> because science can answer all the questions. Science does not speak of the origin of all. Science does not describe meaning. Science describes mechanics. It describes what? It describes how and why. And we need to know those as well. Why we're here, what, we're, what the purpose, the meaning, all of these things comes from a different field of knowledge. And if we truly study the sciences, we'll, we'll see this distinctly. There is certain questions that we still have that science cannot answer. But all the seconds is a condemning science. They'll always say science is good. And in fact, I'm right, it points us back to these other questions. Not just what's there, but why is there? Not just the fact that there is, you know, charged particles, which she was called light. The why of light in the first place. What's the purpose of the sponge moves? Why does this, the moon have phase it does? Why are we made we are? What's our purpose in one's life? Science cannot answer why that made it. Can answer certain things about how, what that I made before, what I made before, parts of you, but not, not why your purpose should be, what it means to be. And so we end up having to face these same questions more deeply and to say, what are these things? You know these things as well. Truth is good. Paragraph two. No, it says paragraphs, so it's going to be a page long or two pages long. But what do you do? No one can escape the fundamental questions. What must I do? So I'm not to simply say, how is that put together? You know, what parts would have, how many bones would have, any human person? What must I do? What must I do? How do I distinguish right with me? The answer is only possible thanks to the splendor of truth which shines forth deeper than the human spirit, as Psalms of Witness. There are many who say, well, let the see some good. If let your face shall not so work. Right? Going back to the dark because we're made in a likeness, because grace itself is made in God's image, because right and wrong is based upon a splendid light God. Looking at our hearts, seeing how we're made, would self show us good and bad. Um, where again, there's a natural law, and deep in our hearts, we know certain things are good, certain things are bad. Going back to the God made us. The light of God's face shines in all his beauty on the council of Jesus Christ. He was the invisible God, the reflection of God's glory, for the grace of truth. Christ is the way, the truth, the life. God became man, and so, he, so knowing the human person who is Jesus, he self the why the man was before. Consequently, the decisive answer to every one of man's questions, and especially when it's the moral questions in particular, is given by Jesus Christ, or rather is Jesus Christ himself. The Second Vatican Council calls. In fact, it's only the mystery of the word part that the light of the mystery of man. Rather than the first man was a figure of the future, namely of Christ the Lord. It is Christ, the last man, fully disclosed man to himself, and told his little call by revealing the mystery of the Father and the Father's love. Every one of us 
was made for the same reason. We're made to be in heaven with God forever. And we see this fully when we see Jesus Christ. We see that God made us, that we were fallen, that loves us, that redeems us, that goes back to himself by sending us his son. And the son that becomes for us the model of all perfection, the model for us to live, showing us how to live and giving us through his death and cross and resurrection the grace of which to live that way. This is why John Paul II says he is the answer. What must I do? Be like Jesus. How do I, how do, I do that? Be like Jesus. Give us help, give us sacraments, follow his teaching. Give us help, the grace, the confession, the sacraments, the gift, special communion. Where am I going? I want to have to do with Jesus. What does this do me? Do I become like my God? The answer to the deepest yearnings of our heart all are in the of Jesus Christ. Because God would command running from the face, we can now see God's glory, God's light, God's truth shining out in the face of Jesus Christ. At the very beginning, the whole second is very clear. It's not some abstract philosophy. It's not some, you know, oh, we're going to get together and we're going to vote to what's right and wrong. We're going to get together and decide together what's good for us. No, we have an answer. And it's not simply a vague religious sensibility, not simply that religion is this vague human creation. It comes to us from above. Creation is revelation, creation is God coming to us. Which is extremely different from the way that it looks at it. You know, the man-made thing, there's this, this stopgap, there's this, you know, because we're idiots. Well, no. This comes to us in the eternal wisdom of himself. Jesus Christ, the light of the nations, shines upon the face of the church. Which he sends forth the whole world to claim God that we preach. John Paul II was further. So not only does God come and give us the answer in the faith of Jesus Christ, but Christ comes to walk in the church. So the light of God comes to Jesus Christ, the light of Jesus Christ comes to us in the church. So we know Jesus Christ, we follow him, we be with him. We have to follow this church. So this church receive our Lord from this church. Not just any church or a church or that church or you know, you're always a life else, one church that comes to us from our Lord. Because God came to us to smell it, he came to us to read himself. Hence the church, which is the people of God among the nations, will attend to the new challenge of history and mankind's efforts to discover the meaning of life. Almost everyone, the answer which comes from the death of Jesus Christ has lost. So, yes, as the ages come and go, there are new, new, new questions, there are new challenges. A hundred years ago, we were talking about phone. You know, we live in, in the time and age and place where, where there's new questions. The answer is ever ancient and new. It's the divine God will turn. Same answer, same truth, doesn't really change. The church remains deeply called for the duty in every age of examining the sign of the time and interpreting that in the light of the gospel. So she can offer in a manner of perfect generation replies to continual questions, a meaning of this life and the life to come, and how do I make it? What am I here for? What do I get there? What does this life have to do with the afterlife? And yes, certain questions are going to be more important to people depending on culture. A certain cultures being more focused. The culture that's very religious is going to have a different question than the culture that's very secular. A culture that loves marriage being different than the culture that's called hates marriage. A culture that's filled with And so, even though the answers are going to be the same, different emphasis are going to be needed, different, uh, different things are going to need to be poured more strongly, different things are going to need to be expressed. Um, and so, we, we, we very much understand very deeply and very well the culture, the nation, um, that the human person has dignity, the individuals matter, that freedom is important, that love is good. We don't have to worry about that. We have that covered. But what we love is to worry about that the human person is not the ultimate answer, that the individuality is not, it needs to be constrained, that we all are made for the same purpose and one religion, or call for one true faith. There's only one truth, not many truths as there are individuals. 
And so, so we either, we either emphasize those things in order to bring the gospel and Christ to our lives. Questions on us? Comments? Okay. Number three. The church's pastors, priests, bishops, or father, in communion with the successor of Peter, are close to the faithful in the Sabbath. They guide and accompany them for their forward teaching, finding every way of speaking with love and mercy, only to believers, to all people of goodwill. The church has a duty to speak not just to Catholics, but also to anyone, whether you're pagan, whether you're Jewish, whether you're Catholic. And we speak with authority because we speak with, with the truth of Christ. Second Vatican Council remains a story of witness this attitude on the part of the church, which is expert in humanity, places itself at the service of every individual in the local world. Why is the church an expert on human nature or on humanity? Well, who made man? Who, who, told, who told the church what man is? God. Who told the church how to be happy? God. And so therefore, when it comes to how to be happy, what a human being, how to get to heaven, we have the answers and greatest source possible. God. So the church, therefore, is an expert on humanity, on human nature, on the human person, on human happiness. And speaks that. And does so not, not as, you know, you're here to serve me and kiss our toes, but you're here to serve to help people get to heaven and to bring everyone there. To serve as every individual. The church knows the issue of morality is why it comes deeply in every human per every person. It involves all people. That's right, wrong, good, and bad. Even those who do not know Christ, the gospel, or God himself. It was precisely on the path of the moral life the way of space was open to all. The Second Iron Council recalled this when it stated that those who have any fault, not about any of God Christ was church, you search for God in the seared heart and the influence of grace, and try to put into effect the will of God is known to them the influence of grace, you get the duty of conscience, to obtain salvation. Council added, always the violence problems deny and helps are necessary for salvation of those who don't fall their own. And they obtain the truth to the express protection of God, who strive to honor the divine grace, they not right life. For whatever religious and truths found in them are considered by the church in preparation of the gospel, and given by him and by everyone, that they may in the end have life. So what's being said? It is not that it doesn't matter what we do. It is not that as long as you're a nice person, everything's going to be okay. What's being said here is that, is that God wants to save us and bring us down. And knowing that means that when we do the, that, that human beings do the best they can, God recognizes the difference between someone who's the best they can of making a mistake. And somebody not giving a darn and falling into the sands. So an analogy I like to use talking about this, because I would say, if when I first met, I was told about the wrong man. If I didn't know you very well, I called you Steph. Would you be offended? Yeah. And it's possibly to correct me. You might correct me, you might not. Because I get called Jacob and Mary Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Children. <laughs> <laughs> but somebody knows you really, really well and knows better, call you by the wrong name. Or someone say, I don't care what your name is, I'm going to call you this makes you feel good. That's a very different thing. Because then they're saying, I don't want to know you. But somebody doing their best to make some mistake is a different position than somebody who's not trying as a kid. And God knows that. And God is, is the same, same thing. So somebody who is trying to know God makes a mistake, the Lord says, what do you know? 
And if somebody, even in the church says, even if somebody, you know, there's no fault of the rush. It's different if it's your own fault. It's your own fault, you're confused, you're messed up. Well, you're going to do that. Then it's your fault. You made a choice. If no fault of your own, you don't know there's a God, you're just trying to, to, to search for truth, do the best you can what you know. At the very least, you can live not right life. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't murder, don't lie. And that is preparation for truth. And those who are doing their best, who are yearning for the truth, and doing their best to follow the Lord the best as they know how, even if it's very vague, the Lord is going to answer that call and to call them deeper to a <coughs> It's a very important principle of theology that God is not a jerk. The Lord wants our salvation. And so if the Lord sees us trying and yearning and striving, even though we fail, the Lord is going to be very merciful, very kind, and very gentle. And opposed to somebody who doesn't give a dollar and, and, and even the same failure. You just love a lot more strictly. <laughs> because they do that. You know, those of you who are parents have raised children. Is the truth? There's a difference between a kid trying and making a mistake and, and being sorry for it. And the kid doesn't care and is doing it because they, they just want to do it. I'm sure you've seen both, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know. And, and, and yeah, when a kid is being a brat, you know, you, you pat the pat the facts. When they're trying hard, making mistakes, you're very done. It's okay. It's, we'll fit this together. More the same way. We're being brats, or we're being making mistakes. And so we're more, more like he's saying this is important for everyone. He's saying this land, this, this, this true morality isn't just for Catholics. This is meant to be helped everybody who's seeking and point back for God and to line the truth in what happens. Lest we fall into individuality and skepticism and fall into false truth. The purpose of the present life. Say In all times, especially in the last two centuries, the Pope, or individually or together called the bishops, have developed and proposed a moral teaching regarding many different spheres of human life. So different areas of life, whether you're at home, whether you're at work, whether you're in church. In Christ's name, under the board, they have exhorted to pass judgment and explain. So they said, this is good, this is bad, don't do this, do that. In the reference on behalf of humanity, that would be the permission. They have confirmed support of the soul. With the guarantee of assistance with the spirit of truth, they have attributed to a better understanding of the moral man in the areas of homosexuality or family, the social and economic political. You notice politics has to be morality. The people who say the church get that out of politics is what we're talking about. Because we have to vote for the morality, we have to have, we have to have a culture society based upon the moral. And so the church is meant, meant to be politicians. The church is meant to die and direct even political life. The tradition of the church and the history of the vanity. The teaching represents a constant deepening of knowledge with regard to morality. They, however, leave necessary to reflect on the whole of the moral teaching. With the precise goal of recalling certain fundamental truths of Catholic doctrine to the present circumstances, which can restore the other time. In other words, they're qualified. People are trying to deny certain things everyone should know that are fundamental to the Catholic faith. People are denying these things. In fact, the situation has come about within the Christian community itself. It's not just from the outside, not just from the pagans, not just from people who are confused. It's now being taught by people who say they're Catholics, by people who are pastors, by people who are claiming to speak the name of Christ. This is experienced this way of numerous doubts and objections of a human, a psychological, and cultural, religious, even properly theological nature, with our church's moral teaching. If you doubt that God is good, doubt that God is true, or doubt that Christ is God, you're going to doubt what kind of arguments. And as an issue comes in the theology, it spreads to all. If you want to work 
matter of limited vocational dissent, that there is now overall a systematic call to the question of traditional moral doctrine on the basis of certain logical and ethical dispositions. So what he's saying is in the past, I have made the one question here and there. People who say overall say what are the categories. But now he's saying there are people who are saying everything's been the question. The entire right and wrong is called the question. Based upon these people would be based upon what you say it's true, you know, what, what, what's my conscience, what's right and wrong, what's right for me. So everything is being attacked. At the root of all of these presuppositions, the root of all of these attacks, is the more or less obvious influence of currents of thought which end by attaching to human freedom the essential relationship to truth. So freedom without truth, John the Second says, saying, isn't freedom. And we live in a world that's trying to separate freedom from truth. That's why it goes back to connecting those two things together. Freedom from the two together. If you try to live freely without truth, you end up hurting yourself. It was around. Be of the truth and have to work together. Mm-hmm. Therefore, there's a visual doctrine of natural law. Universality is to everybody, the permanent validity of the precepts in every day and age is rejected. Certain of the church's moral teaching are found to be unacceptable. Like the doctrine of there's no abortion allowed, no perception, no divorce. The magistrate of itself is necessarily capable of necessarily to be in matters of morality only in order to do our constant close values. In other words, they're saying, people are saying, well, the church only has the role of this kind of give suggestions, kind of go ahead and say, this is a good thing to do, a bad thing to do. But, but can't teach, can't say, this is always everywhere true. And then the individual will independently make their own decisions. This is what John was saying, it is concerning in particular, we should recognize our statement of the lack of harmony between the traditional response of the church and certain theologies and theological positions. We can even in the seminaries and the factories of theology with regard to the of great importance to the church for the life of the faith of Christians, as well as the life of society itself. In particular, this one of the questions is the commandments of God. To read about every human heart and the part of the covenant, which they really have the capacity to clarify the daily decisions of individuals in the science. Think of the Ten Commandments, they important they want. Is it possible to love God, obey God, love God neighbor, without all those commandments, all circumstances? Can I, can I, can I love God, I love my neighbor. Can, is, can I see? I don't have abortion, I don't love God neighbor. Also, the pain is frequently heard, which affects the intrinsic and unbreakable law of the faith of Rabbi. Is it membership of the church or internal unity would be decided on the basis of faith alone? Or the sphere of morality, a pluralism of opinions and kind of behavior we tolerate? It being left to the individual conscience or the diversity of cultural contexts. In other words, I can be a Catholic as long as I believe in Christ and I follow. What, we, what they're saying. They're saying, the claim is they're pretending I can put in follow Christ, but still live a immoral life. Oh, I'm living with someone about my husband. Well, that's okay because I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm only Catholic. Oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a you know, yes, I, I know that, that I'm contracepting, but, but I live Mass every Sunday, therefore I believe in Christ, I'm only Catholic. This is what's being proposed, that, that Donald Trump is fighting against. Is this kind of curve, which again is, is, kind of, is, is still prevalent. You know? It's had the wrong way, unfortunately. And we see these things all the time. Um, so these are questions that are very relevant and very important to look at. Is following Christ simply a matter of believing the right things, but also to do with doing the right things? It's both that. You have to both believe and act the right way. Family's always good. Given these circumstances, which still exist, I came to the decision that I announced on my excellent letter, Bridges Domine, issued on August 1987, on the second century after the death of St. Paul, of August the Glory. Do I consider the code to be able to treat more fully and more deeply the issues regarding the place of moral theology? 
Thanks for still being a better friend of mine. I serve hence and death. The reason why he's tanked with Gregorius was Gregorius is part of the Dr. Church, who is known for his moral theology. The Gregorius moral theology was obeyed to be this great saint, this great doctor of the church. So, I address myself to you, men of others of the Episcopal, of officials, who share with me the responsibility of secret and sound teaching. With the intention of fully setting forth certain aspects of doctrine, which are of crucial importance in face of the certainly a genuine crisis. There's difficulties which they engender and most serious implications for the moral life and faith between the church as well as for a social life. If you don't believe these things or all these ways, or you don't understand this, or teach them very clearly, we're going to have a schism, we're going to have a great visit in the side of the family, we're going to, to be very, we're going to hurt, we're going to hurt ourselves. So it's important to know these things, to believe these things, teach these things, or confirm. This is what the purpose of letters. This is the coast along the way as they plan published only now. One of the reasons is that it's fitting which be preceded by the Catholic of the Catholic Church, which contains complete systematic exposition of the all teaching. The Catholic presents the moral life of believers as fundamental elements, as many aspects of the life of the children of God. Recognizing their faith and their dignity because they've been called to belong to Jesus Christ, they have a new role, a new position. Christians are asked to call to lead their poor and life group of the Christ. The sacraments and prayer that receive the grace of Christ and gives the Holy Spirit to be able to such a life. Consequently, we're referring back to Catholic with a sure and authentic reference text teaching Catholic doctrine. This letter will only limit itself to dealing with certain fundamental questions regarding our church world teaching. Taking the form of a sermon about issues being debated at the system of the Williams. But the letter is therefore the purpose to set forth the guard of problems being discussed, the principles of the moral teaching based upon the scripture, and living at the of tradition. At the same time, to allow the consequences of dissent that teaching is meant. So as to say, here's what's true, here's the problems we're facing. This would happen if, if, if people fought, try to do things this way. But, this, but there's also a bigger text that's more than that. That's the text. So. It's fine. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. That's what we're going to be going through next. A long case to get, to get to this. Mm -hmm. uh, are there questions or concerns or comments of the sofa? Close to the prayer, then thank you for coming. And I guess we'll see you to the next week. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We ask you to help us to know the right thing, to believe the right thing, and to act the right way. You all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it's now and ever shall be. For all thou hast in common. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.